Hi, everyone. This is Dawn Richard, also known as The Awakening with Dawn, and this is the Wake Up to Real Love podcast, where we share stories of struggles and triumphs in love, sex, and relationships, along with expert advice to create more conscious connections. I am super honored today to get to know my guest better, Rick Tarrant. Welcome, Rick. Hello there. Thank you for inviting me. I am so excited to get to know you. First of all, I love your voice. I fell in love with that the first time I heard you. And then I heard a little bit more about your story and I thought, oh, he needs to, he needs to be here. <laughs> I want to have a conversation with well, him. I appreciate that. I, I, was, I, I'm, I can tell it's getting a little weak because I've been awake since four o'clock in the morning and it's about four o'clock in the afternoon. So 12 <clears throat> hours is like, oh, I'm yeah. <laughs> well, we'll try to do the best we can. So Rick is yeah. um, a long time radio aficionado. He started broadcasting when he was 15 and he just told me he's tried hard his whole life not to get a real job <laughs> but i think yeah. this sounds like an amazing job radio and audio producer music lover guitar player creative um father of two grandfather of six uh you're like a renaissance man and i really look forward to getting to know you better a renaissance man okay yeah. i'm thinking da vinci or something here <laughs> So I just wanted to start off asking you, uh, because I saw on your Facebook page, you asked, what did, what did you wish that you would have learned in high school? Ah, oh, you've been doing your research. I'm trying to remember my motivation when I did that. You know, sometimes just uh, trying to be, get more involved in social media, which you I just never... said is never, new to you. It is new. I mean, uh -huh. because uh, I've been pretty much... Um, well, afraid of it, always afraid of, uh, never was one to get in chat rooms on AOL back in the day. It just made me nervous. I don't like that. It's just, uh -huh. <clears throat> and now I'm learning, wow, if you don't put yourself out there, you know, you're just sunk in the water. So, so sometimes a, an idea or a po somebody, an idea would just pop into my head and I'll, oh, there's a Facebook post and put it out there. I don't uh -huh. even remember what my motivation was, but I remember getting a little pushback from one of the girls I went to high school. I learned everything I needed in high school and then went to college and learned everything else. And it's like, okay, I wasn't really, really? a statement here. Really? Um, yeah, whatever. But um, what do I wish? I, you know, I think what I was thinking was I wish in high school there had been uh, less emphasis on coloring in the lines, mm. sitting in your chair straight, behaving, acting right, and there was more room for not chaos, but creativity and coloring outside the lines and authenticity. You know, I've heard it said that uh, the American educational system is designed to teach us how to work in a factory, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or a nine to five job, punch in, punch out, you right. know, learn how to spell, learn how to do your math, basically learn how to be a good boy, a good girl, and just don't cause trouble. I think that's what we're taught in those 12 years or from K to 12. And maybe that's right. Maybe it's inaccurate. I'm one of those guys that says, I have opinions, but they're my opinions. I don't ever claim that they're right. You know, I have my ideas about this, that, and the other thing. Uh -huh. um, I want to live in a world where we all have grace to share our ideas and not be right and not be wrong. You know, yeah. we don't live in that America right now. And it really, it's, yeah, it's grieving me. So, yeah, I wish I had learned in high school to, um, to be able to think outside of the box, to think entrepreneurial thoughts mm -hmm. and to have those things encouraged. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's where I was going with that post. And that's a much longer answer than the post was. <laughs> No, I think that's really interesting, though, because, you know, in my parents' time and their parents' time, they did stay in one place for 30, 40, 50 yeah. years, and they were they actually had a retirement. But companies are so different nowadays, and people are so transitory um, that it's really hard to stay in one place. Yeah, my father-in-law told me once um, when we were nearly married, um, I was just starting my business back around 82. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, he called me brother-in-law. Brother-in-law? <laughs> I wouldn't hire you. I was like, why is that, Papa? Well, you, you, you've had too many jobs. Mm -hmm. And in the radio world, I don't know if you remember the TV show, WKRP, um, yeah. Yeah. the sitcom. You know, the theme song goes, um, moving town to town, up and down the dial. 
Well, uh-huh. that's the that's the way the radio biz was, you know. It was right. Like a left high school. I mean, you know, went to a semester of college, uh, went to a from a little town in Arkansas to a a little bit bigger town in in Monroe, Louisiana. And stayed there about a year, and then across the river to a station in Greenville, Mississippi. Stayed there probably less than a year, down to the Gulf Coast of Biloxi. Uh-huh. There about a year, over to New Orleans, back to... Anyway, that's just the way it worked, because it, it, there was no benefit to stay someplace 10 years. Uh-huh. You wanted to get better fast, and the only way you got better was to leave the small town, get to the medium town, get to the big town, right. and work with better talent. It's kind of right. the idea about being in a mastermind in business. You want to ra- you want to be around smarter people than you. Right. And so it didn't make sense. You didn't want to stay 10 years, 20 years. And what? Why would you want to stay in Podunk for 20 years? That'd be you boring. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and yeah, anyway. So that was the old school thinking clashing even with me back, back then, you know, so many years ago. But so how, so how were you able to do that i mean you said you started out when you were 15 like what drew you to wanting to be in radio um that's pretty simple (laughs) i just wanted a job and um okay i'll tell you the sorted i'll tell you the sorted story so i'm skipping six period study hall i'm in the 10th grade you bad boy i know just (laughs) So I'm cutting out because, you know, it's study hall, six right. period. Right. Who's going to hang around for study hall? So I, I leave and um, an upperclassman offers me a ride home. And uh, I climbed in his pickup truck and uh, he's taking me home. And I said, well, where are you headed? And he said, oh, I'm going out to my job out at the radio station. And, I was, and we had just moved to this town in Arkansas, like in the summer of 69. I couldn't, you know, mom's out there, go find a job. Go to the gas station, no one's hiring. Go to the grocery store, no one's hiring. You know, it was like all the menial minimum wage jobs uh-huh. in that little town of 5,000. Um, you know, there weren't McDonald's and things like that back then, right? And I couldn't find a job. So when he said he was going to his job, I said, well, how do you get a job like that? And he said, oh, my daddy's the engineer out at the radio station. Come out sometime. I'll show you around. So I went out, who knows, not, not too long after that. And... Um, Met the owner, met the owner's wife, got to watch him on the air, you know, playing records and being disc jockey. It just looked like the coolest thing. But then uh, I never heard anything. And they had a program out at the radio station that um, they would always hire a high school kid Mm -hmm. to work, you know, 11th and 12th grade. And then we were right between two towns, McGee, Arkansas, and Dermot, right? So one year they would hire a kid from McGee and then when he graduated high school, they'd hire a kid from Dermot. Uh-huh. Anyway, I'm giving you way too much, way too much uh, backstory. <laughs> but um, I never heard anything. And then uh, I did, I won't say exactly what I did, but let's just say I got into trouble with the law. Mm-hmm. And my dad had to bail me out of jail. And my punishment was he shaved all my hair off. Now, I had been kicked out of school uh, a few months prior for having too long a hair. Oh Remember, my this gosh. Is the early, early seventies. Right. Wow, and it wasn't yeah. that long, I, yeah. you know, it came over your collar, but, uh, his punishment was quarter of an inch, no more than a quarter of an inch all the way around. So of course, seventies long hair, I'm embarrassed. I make up some story about, Oh, I'm, I had a scalp infection, you know, <laughs> which <laughs> now seems g- worse than the other. But anyway, um, but then with the short, the short haired Rick went out to the radio station to visit my new friend and met the owner again. And I only found this out a couple of years later when the owner said to me, you know, that first time you came out here, he said, uh, I wasn't too impressed. Oh. So, but you know, you came out again and you just, I don't know, you just struck me as a fine upstanding young man. And he gave me a shot at uh, this radio thing, which you had to come and work for free for six months training, uh-huh. Uh-huh. you know, um, and then get to do it. But, you know, while some of my friends are out there spreading asphalt on the highway department in the summertime, I'm in air conditioned comfort spinning 45 RPM records and talking on a microphone. 
<laughs> that sounds amazing. So when mama said, why don't you quit burning up my gas and go get yourself a real job? The cotton gin's hiring. You know, I was like, oh, please don't make me work at the cotton gin. So <laughs> How my life would have been different if I had gotten the cotton gin job. You know, yeah, so. so thank goodness for skipping your study hall. Hey, you know what? I don't guess I thought of that. And thank goodness for getting in trouble because yeah. if I had not gone out there with a shaved head. Yeah. So I don't know if that's an encouragement, but it's kind of an encouragement to me again. Sometimes your biggest screw ups can lead to something else. I mean, yeah. both, both of those skipping class, I never would have met Mike yeah. and who later uh, died fighting in a, as a volunteer, as a volunteer mm. firefighter and a wall collapsed on him. Aww. God, God rest him. Um, Again, I'm wandering all over the place. No, you're fine. But you're it just fine. hit me that, you know, those two things, not good things, ended up defining you know, your life. Yeah, for at least for a long time, anyway. Yeah. 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 So, what have you loved about being in, in the radio field? Initially, I think uh, going back to, you know, way back when, I felt. I found my I found a place to belong because um, from the youngest I mean from the time I was born daddy moved around uh -huh. um, first it was to school and then it was to the army and then um, out of the army and back to school and going to Illinois and down to Florida and then to Tennessee and then over to Seattle Washington and then moving us down to Alabama and then over mm -hmm. to Arkansas I mean it was like you were always the new kid in fact, the only place I really felt like I belonged was in Seattle because we were at least there for second grade, third grade, fourth grade, part of fifth grade where you're, you have friendships, right? Mm -hmm. And playmates and things like that. And really after that, I never felt like I belonged. You were mm -hmm. always the outsider, especially down south, you know, some guy would be driving down the street and flip you the bird, you know, just because you were the new guy, mm -hmm. you know, it was just, just, just harsh. So when I found radio, at, well, band, first of all, was the first place where I felt like I belonged. You know, you're at least in a community, you're in a group. Mm -hmm. And um, that was when radio, you were playing the trumpet, you mean? Yeah, I used to, you know, play a little trumpet there in the marching band. And it was nice to learn formations out on the football field, you know, small 40 piece band, you know, but you, you belonged to something. Uh -huh. And um, in the radio thing, you're by yourself. But yet you'd go to school. I remember one day I'm sitting in class and I'm trying to contribute and the class is all, you know, nobody's listening. And one of the big football jocks said, pipe down, y'all. Taryn gets enough static on the radio. <laughs> and, I, and it was like, oh, he just made he just gave me a little bit of cool factor. You know what I mean? <laughs> the big football jock acknowledged the, the radio guy. You know, anyway, um, that was kind of the beginning. And then uh, I don't know. It's back then being a, a disc jockey was kind of cool. I mean, you were on, you didn't have Spotify. You didn't have Amazon music. You didn't right. have YouTube. You didn't have right. all these sources for your music. You got your music from one place. You heard it on the radio. Yeah. And the guy in between, you know, telling you, you know, this new record from the Beatles or whoever, um, that was a cool job to have. And of course we would stay up late at night listening to radio stations in cities far away, like WLS in Chicago, I can still hear the, hear the John Records Landacker, and yes, Records is truly my middle name. I can <laughs> still remember staying up late hearing those those late night disc jockeys and just envisioning that you could be one of those, right? Uh -huh. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. They they call it getting the radio bug, and once it bites you, it's like it's in you, and mm -hmm. kind of hard to shape. Let me show you something. <clears throat> so. You'll have to excuse the mess. So this is something I just acquired. Oh yeah. Let me see. Two weeks, and I'm still working on it. You told me about your long drive to go get it. You see that? Uh huh. I don't know Can what it, it is though. Well, it's uh, all the knobs are off. Uh huh. This is this was where you turn on your microphone and go, this is the voice of Southeast Arkansas, KVSA, 1220 on your dial, McGee, Arkansas. And then you'd play a record and turn up the song, and this was where you, that was where you controlled everything. I don't that know if you can turn me off mic like that. That was yeah. your instrument panel. 
that was the, the mix board. That was the console that where you played the records and the commercials and the microphone. That was the first thing. I, oops, I guess I should move my. Uh, that was the first board I ever, ever worked on back when I was 15 and 16. Wow. And you said that and, was uh, from the 50s, 60s? Yeah, they, that went into service in June of 1953. Uh huh. And uh, over here, I'm geeking out here but a uh, couple of pieces of gear um i've been in cleanup mode <laughs> refurbing this stuff because it came i mean it nasty condition i mean bird poop and the whole thing so i'm cleaning up these uh haven't fired this one up yet but uh anyway it's uh, vintage gear from my very first radio station and any audio guy will tell you that this old tube stuff these are the tubes that came out of that mixer. I mean, this is a wow. gallon bag full of tubes. I don't know if they all work or not, but um, that's part of the, the refurb But, but the equipment still works. Uh, we hope so. Yeah. See, I'm, I'm in the process, so like- uh, Oh, of putting it, that, like putting it back together. I got that mixer and then my uh, engineer who's consulting me said, where's your power supply? And I'm like, power supply i didn't know minor I didn't. details <clears throat> so the next week i'm driving back down three hours I'm driving back three hours digging through what is really a mess mm -hmm. terrible mess a nightmare of a mess um to find the power supply and along the way i found these other two items that were a part of the mixer anyway i know it's it's geek stuff for me but it's just it's part of that it's just in me and i was pondering now is this bad is this like uh, i'm just stuck in the past and i don't want to leave the past and i was like no this it's a part of my past yeah but my goal is to get this refurbed and put it in my studio yeah there's a coolness factor if i can get it working but the way they made stuff back then uh-huh i mean that console is built like a tank they don't build stuff like that anymore they right. don't build stuff that's meant to last 70 years anymore. Right. And the uh, electronics that actually affect the sound, um, sonically superior. I mean, there are companies now that remake vintage gear. And I talked to the owner through email a couple of days ago. When he saw the pictures of this, he was just blowing his mind. He just said, oh, my God. He said, please tell me you're going to run your microphone through these preamps and through this and that and the other. I said, oh, yeah, that's it. And he said, anyway, he was just like, wow. He said, you have got yourself a treasure. So that's awesome. That's, that's part of what turns my crank <laughs> and uh, part of the journey, you know? Yeah. So how, how, when you're in a studio, basically by yourself ish, um, do you feel like you belong? Because you were talking about how you never felt like you belonged moving around. I, I was in the, my dad was in the air force. So I experienced the same thing, always sort of feeling like an yep. outsider. Because mm -hmm. everybody else was, you know, already in their groups and stuff and you're coming in and they're like, who are you? You know, so how did you create that sense of community for yourself as you were, because you continued to move from place to place to place? Well, it's interesting. Um, back in the day when you had a, and my wife says, don't say that. It makes you sound old. Well, look. <laughs> um. <laughs> Age is just relative, Rick. <laughs> yeah, no, anyway. Um Every station was like joining a team. Uh -huh. So at the little station in Arkansas, that was like the, the little farm team. And then you moved up to a, a minor league team and bounced around some minor leagues. And then when I hit New Orleans, it's like, ah, oh, now you've hit the major leagues. Now you're working with the big boys. So it's like, you know, you get to play with Joe DiMaggio and, and, and Babe Ruth. And you know, I'm not really a baseball person, but uh -huh. you catch my drift. Yeah. So there was community at each station. It was like joining a team and there was a camaraderie and it was really cool because you know it's like my station's better than your station there was always another station that was in competition with you right uh -huh. and i always tried to make sure i was at the one that was on top you know the better the better station or at least what i perceived as the the cooler hipper better station uh -huh. um and so there there was community and then again being on the air then when you went out into the public and interacted with people they knew who you were Oh yeah, I was listening to you last night, you know, that, that kind of a thing. So it's isolated, but yet you got to be sort of an entertainer, even though I'm an extrovert is like for 20 seconds, you can throw on that microphone and, you know, yell out the call letters and, 
and uh, have fun with back then you know you could have fun with the intros of songs you know just just having fun it was just fun you know well that's the great thing about not getting a real job i mean that's a how amazing would it be for everybody to get paid to have fun at work <sighs> yeah i got real spoiled i sure did yeah mm. and then um <clears throat> I uh, was working here in Memphis at my dream station. I remember I was 21 and I remember the moment where I went, wow, I just made my goal and I'm 21. Is that all there is? You know, I remember thinking that at 21. Is that all, is that all there is? Hmm, maybe I need to get some more goals. Uh -huh. But uh, as, as life will guide you sometimes, I tell people I'm the Rick that got fired when Rick Dees got hired. I don't know if you're familiar with Rick Dees. I but... am. I actually used to listen to him every weekend. Yeah, on the countdown. Yeah. Which I think he still does. Does he really? So, wow. And I used to be in, I used to be in the countdown business, but that's that's a little more down the road. So um, Rick Dees gets hired on our on WHBQ here in Memphis. Uh -huh. And my boss calls me in. We had a staff meeting on Sunday. And he said, man, I don't, I hate, he said, man, I've been drinking all day because I just don't know how to break this to you. But the truth was, he was always drinking all day. <laughs> that was nothing new. <laughs> no, he didn't need an excuse. Um, but he said, I got to lay somebody off. He said, and I don't want to do that to you. He said, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to, uh, Monday morning, I want you to sign up over at Elkins Institute. I want you to learn how to get your first class FCC license. And then I want you to become our production director. And um, I called up the school on Monday morning and I said, well, that's great, but we're going out of business. So oh, no. <laughs> that opportunity eluded me. <clears throat> but then uh, a job opened at a production company where they did jingles, you know, the, the things that sing the call yeah. letters of the radio yeah. stations. Yeah. There was a company in Memphis called William B. Tanner Company. And we did, they did jingles and we did promos for radio stations. You know, those things you hear on the air that go, uh, you know, WABC plays the best music, that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So we did all that kind of production. And uh, so I spent a year or so there learning how to produce on tape, four track recording tape, you know. Which is uh, what four the Beatles track, Four track is the precursor to eight track. Yeah, and uh, the Beatles made four track famous by recording Sgt. Pepper's. I think they had two four track machines, and they would record four tracks, and then they would bounce it over to a track, and then they would record and bounce it. And anyway, wow. Uh, I learned how to produce on a four track reel to reel tape recorder, and um, one thing led to another, and I started my own production company. And somewhere along the way in that story, I became a Christian. And I got real excited when I heard uh, Christian music mm -hmm. that sounded like what I played on the radio, the Top 40 radio. Because mm -hmm. up to then, Christian music was kind of country and hymns and, you know, it was for the older folks. It just wasn't, wasn't, wasn't more, our... Bo more boring. Yeah, I mean, you know... When, Traditional. You know, Glenn Campbell had an album of hymns and that was about the most contemporary thing I could find. Uh -huh. And... Uh, when I started hearing, uh, well, when B.J. Thomas, who was a big pop star in his day, um, did a Christian album, I went, wow, people need to hear this, mm -hmm. you know? And so I got excited about Christian music, and Christian radio didn't exist. Christian music radio didn't exist. The only Christian radio was 15-minute preacher programs, right? Uh -huh. And send in money, and we'll send you a prayer cloth, that kind of stuff. It was uh -huh. not very sophisticated. Um, Anyway, little, slowly by, uh, little by little, stations started playing more of this thing called contemporary Christian music. And young artists like Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith and rock bands like Petra. And here in Memphis, we had uh, DeGarmo and Key. They were some pioneer um, musicians in the, in the Christian music space. Did and you so ever I know started... take, take Six? Take Six uh, probably didn't fall into that category, but... They sure were amazing. Yeah, I don't they think were, they, they were. They were like an R and B sort of. Yeah, acapella, but yeah. And I think they had one song. Actually, they probably were backing up somebody more famous in the uh, Christian realm. Uh -huh. But um, yeah, just contemporary stuff, you know. Uh -huh. And so I got involved in that, and as as that began to grow in popularity, and as uh, more stations began to add the music, well, I remember my goal back then was to be the number one. Christian production company in America. 
which was not a high bar because there were none. <laughs> but it's talk easy about, to be number one when you're the only one. <laughs> exactly. Talk about carving your niche, you know, getting into a niche market, you know. I, I didn't even know I was being brilliant, but what you do is you find something that nobody is doing, nobody else is doing. and then do that, and then hopefully some people will come along. So then for the next 21 years, I got to enjoy a business building and being a part of a community and being invited to workshops in Nashville and teach them how to do production. And, and um, I just woke up every morning knowing what I was supposed to do and who I was supposed to serve. Uh -huh. And along the way, um, I got to do that countdown that I'd always wanted to do. Uh -huh. In fact, I remember praying one morning. I thought, Lord, wouldn't it be cool if there was like a, a countdown of Christian music right before Casey Kasem comes on, you know, ah. on, you know, on the top 40 stations. Yeah. And uh, along the way, that opportuni opportunity uh, presented itself. And I got to do that for about 16 years. And wow, um, that's amazing. it was it was just too much fun and, then, and got to, you know, interview so many recording artists. And uh, it was fun to have some of these newer recording artists saying, man, I've been listening to your radio show for the last, you know, all through college and high school. And, and now they're, you know, selling platinum records. And it's like, that's pretty cool that you got to play a role, that I got to play a role in, in people's lives. That. Yeah. Yeah. But then um, about 17 years ago, tragedy struck. And uh, as a... As a friend of mine once said, when somebody stole something from his daddy, his daddy used to say, well, I guess he needed it worse than I did. Um, I lost my business. I guess somebody needed it worse than I did. Mm -hmm. And uh, lost my home, uh, in debt to the IRS, um, not great at administration, not great at keeping up with filing taxes and all that kind of stuff. Uh -huh. Again, creative type. I really should have surrounded myself with more administration. Um, and then just went into a very deep, dark, like I said, for 21 years, I knew exactly what I was supposed to do. Um, an artist named Michael W. Smith had a song once called Place in This World, and that was what I lost. I lost my place in this world, and I was lost. And I've been lost for a long time, and only recently feel like I'm coming out of being lost, you know, and I'd be lying if I said I was totally out of the woods, but... It's, um, so where did you go when you were lost all these years? Well, the first year, I can't even tell you. The first year, and I'm not trying to be dramatic, I literally, I can see myself sitting in a chair. I, I, I downsized. I thought I downsized, and I realized, oh, man, I didn't, know how, I didn't know how low I was going. I didn't downsize near enough. I mean, we had a nice 4,000-square-foot house and studio out in, out in the county, and and this and is with then, your wife, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. The only thing I didn't lose was my family. Mm. I'd say I, I lost my business. I lost my home. I lost my mind. But I didn't lose my wife. I didn't lose my kids. You know, you know it was one of those deals, though, where you have to call your daughter at a private school in Nashville and say, honey, you got to come home. Because mm. we, boy, that's, that's a hard. It's like everything, you know, that can make a man feel like a failure. I, you know. You experience. I'm, I'm liable it. to start crying right now. It's it's a heartbreak. It was just a a goddamn heartbreak, you know. And um, that first year, I can just remember sitting there in the in the bedroom, just sobbing, weeping, and and saying, "What has become of me? My how the mighty have fallen," you know. Mm. And um, I don't know where that first year went. It literally just disappeared. And one year to the date. From when my trouble started, July 22nd, which was my uh, daughter's birthday, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I got a call from Sirius Satellite Radio, and uh, they wanted me to uh, be the program director of their uh, All Elvis station, which was broadcasting from Graceland. And um, that, I thought, wow, interesting, interesting timing. One year ago, my life was devastated. A year later, this must be, it must have just been a season of, you know, I had to go through, and now, here we go. Now, man. Satellite radio. I had been dreaming of satellite radio since the 70s, mm. when, again, it was just a figment of my imagination. Right. And now here it was. I thought this was my life's calling. And um, that turned out to be a, another nightmare year because of uh, a director who uh, fear and intimidation was his way of managing people. It was just, mm. and I'm, you know, as they say, I was a grown-ass man. And 
working for a, I don't know what his insecurities were, but he was taking it out on, you know. So that didn't work out. And then it, it, after a year of that, it was like, man, I gotta, I gotta get away. I just gotta get out. Somebody's gonna die here, <laughs> you know? And um, yeah, so again, sorry to get so gloomy, but it was no, a, no, it was a mean... gloomy, dark time. And I'm so glad now, these years, years later, you know, now that I've got grandchildren that call me pops and love me and, you know, it's such a joy to see them pull up in the driveway and literally come running out of the car. They can't wait to get to Granny and Pop's house, you know, and give you a big old hug. And my uh, Molly, my only granddaughter, and I, I like to tell her, Molly, you're my favorite granddaughter. <laughs> and uh, just nine years old and giving me the hugs and little two-year-old giving you hugs. So I'm so glad, as they say, I didn't find a, a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Because mm -hmm. I sure considered it. I thought about it. I was that unhappy. Do you know, Rick, I mean, you're not the only one. I mean, I don't know if you've ever talked to people who uh, have struggled with, you know, a sense of dis depression and overwhelm and hopelessness. And this I haven't talked to that many because you go into isolation mode and you yeah. think you're the only one. Right. And, and part of what brought me down was shame. Excuse me. <clears throat> which was tied to, well, some sexual abuse when I was a child, physical abuse from an abusive father, um, so much to be ashamed of. And then the way things went down with me, it made it appear that I had done something wrong and the other guy was the injured party. Mm -hmm. And I had to sign a document where I couldn't tell my story. Mm -hmm. And so you have no voice. Right. You can't defend yourself. Right. You legally can't. You know, I can't tell specifics now. This is the most I've ever opened up. Um, and it's kind of like, you know, I, did you, I, back when I had money, I used to see a, a psychiatrist and he said, you know, the thing about fear is, is if you'll open the closet door and shine a light on it, it's not so scary. Yeah. You know? But after this happened, I just, just. Yeah, you withdraw, you retreat, you hide and pretend. Yeah. Yeah. No? exactly and uh yeah so like you can't talk about it because to talk about it would be to um expose your your most vulnerable place yeah it's tough it was hell you know and i'm so glad i'm not there so um, so how did you get from that place to a, to even just like the first little movement of I can see some light because this is what I think a lot of people struggle with. You, you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, right? And when you do, you assume it's a train coming straight at you. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, you know, all I can say is just, you know, for me, it was just hanging on. I mean, literally during the, the first year or so, I mean, anything I put my hand to went wrong. Everything I put my hand to went wrong. Um, even in the world of voiceover, it just nothing worked. One day I went to a convenience store to get something out of the cooler and I pulled open the door and the next thing I know I'm seeing stars. The hinge on the door had broken and careened me in the head. Oh my gosh. Like, it's like, really? <laughs> really? Yeah, Seriously? really? Seriously? I mean, can't I even open a freaking, freaking refrigerator door. door. Uh -huh. I mean, that's the way, you know, it's like a radio buddy of mine said, Oh yeah, you had the Midas touch. Everything you touch turned to rusty mufflers, you know? Okay, right. Um, you'd have to know what Midas muffler was. Um, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm thinking of like Wiley e. coyote trying to chase the road runner and he just explodes at every, you know, turn. <laughs> yeah. And the anvil falls on your head and it's like, <laughs> right. right. It was just, it was like, and at some point again, in my faith, I just thought, well, you know, the Israelites had to walk through the wilderness. It was a pre, uh, you know, 40 years. And I guess I'm just in that place and there's just not a damn thing I can do about it. And just, just, just hang on. I wish, I wish I had a better thing to, I'm just telling you where I was at. Yeah, no. So, so hanging on means just like tomorrow's to survive a new day. the day. Tomorrow's to survive a new the day. Well, 
Like where's about, where's your about faith? Tomorrow. I'm just where's your faith in where's your faith in this? Where's I, your you know my faith? Um, I, it made me wonder: Did I even have any? Hmm. Um, and I've recently thought: You know, I didn't lose my faith, but I lost my hope, hmm. and my spirit was definitely broken. Mm-hmm. And you just can't say ah, shake it off, fix it. You know. Um, but I did. It was enough to give me something to cling to. Mm -hmm. And I will say this. um, There was a a gentleman who spoke into my life before all this went down. And I don't know, you know, you or your audience uh, believe in such things. But um, this man had an intuitive gift, I guess. He could see things. Yeah. Not all the time, but sometimes he could see things. Yeah. And he said, Rick, with you, I see seven corn stalks and he said they've been ravaged and consumed and remember this is about four years before any of my trouble started i see seven corn stalks that have been pecked clean by the birds who've come and devoured all the fruitfulness and i was like "Mm, that doesn't sound good no and he said and then i see another seven corn stalks but these are loaded with corn and and lush and beautiful and tassels blowing in the breeze. It's a delightful scene, he said. And I hear a word that says these are the same corn stalks that represent two different seasons of your life, Mm -hmm. one past and one future. And he said, coming, he said, you've gone through a season of devastation, but coming will be a season of abundance in every area and walk of life. And he said, you've asked yourself, what did you do wrong? And he said, you did nothing wrong, but you had to go through this so you could show others how to drive away the birds. Mm. And that one word has hung over me all these years and thought, well, how do I help somebody else get through this crap? Because if I can, I'm happy to help. That's why I'm talking to you, I guess. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to tell my story maybe as a cautionary tale of what not to do, (laughs) you know. Um, Yeah, I'll try not to go too far down the faith hole, but, uh, or rabbit hole, but... um, You can go wherever you want to go, Rick. Well, I think part of it that I forgot was um, telling myself the truth. Truth that I knew. Truth that, again, comes from Scripture, you know, of... um, I am more than a conqueror. I can do all things through Christ. Um, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. And yet I forgot all those things. I quit saying those things. You know, I know these things. They're in my heart. They're in my head. And yet I was, the the, the wound was so deep that I couldn't even muster up the courage to say those things because it sounded like bullshit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And sorry if that's... You know, no, uh, no, that's not, it's, it's not offensive at all. Feel free it's to like I told my son when he was in high school, I said, son, you've seen the righteous version of your daddy. You've seen the unrighteous, unholy version of your daddy. I said that they both inhabit the same body. They both are who I am. And I think that's true with all of us. We, there's good and bad in all of us. And it's like, kind of like the old thing, which, which are you going to feed? Which are you going to fuel, you know? Uh-huh. And um, so... I, I think I think that's really important though because we all have those seasons in our life where we feel like shit about ourselves <laughs> where we don't where we feel ashamed where we feel like we have to hide and pretend for some reason mm. where we feel less than where we feel we're not enough where we feel we're not important or valuable or worthy of anything <laughs> love abundance prosperity <clears throat> Um, connections, you know, the, the places where we doubt our, we doubt ourselves, our value, our value, because we feel so completely disconnected from our source. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, which came first, the chicken or the egg? When you're in that state, you don't care. (laughs) Yeah, you don't. (laughs) You don't because you're, because you're so, um, you're so like you put your hat on your head. You're so in the dark that you can't see the light. Yeah. And so then you start seeing people who are prospering 
-hmm. And uh, I saw one guy who built my home out in Arlington, and he went bankrupt at the tune of like $40 million. Wow. And it's, from my perspective, he didn't skip a beat. He didn't lose his mind. He didn't lose his attitude. He just kept, the next thing I know, he's selling rental property and, you know, making tens of thousands of dollars a month, you know. And I asked him to take me out or uh, to go out to breakfast. And I just asked him, I said, how did you recover? How'd you recover so fast? I don't get it. Uh -huh. I'm down in the dumps. And, and um, there's something um, our marketing mentor, Pedro Adeo, says. He says, when you look for a deliverer, you find your oppressor. Uh -huh. And I believe that's true. And in this case... I actually went to work for this guy, and it was the most humiliating, the lowest. It was, um, and I don't mean to disparage him at all. It was just not what I was supposed to be doing. It was not I mean, in I alignment was literally with... doing minimum wage stuff to, like, accompany him. You know, I'd go out to L.A. and make a, a, rental, a real estate presentation. We sold rental properties. I got into real estate estate uh -huh. um, selling rental properties from west tennessee to southern california investors wh who couldn't believe you could get a you know a three bedroom two bath house for one hundred fifty thousand dollars. you know brand new never been lived in um but then we would make a divergent trip to some place in nebraska to pick up some old pickup truck that he liked to collect and then we'd drive it from nebraska back to tennessee you know, sleeping, sharing a room in a hotel. It was just, I was miserable. It was like mm. the lowest of the low. And I, I had an, a radio hero friend from Dallas come to town one day, and we had known each other years prior, and he sent me an email, hey, let's reconnect. And uh, he came to town, and he looked at me, and his name was Tom Dooley, wonderful, wonderful man, great, huge voice. He said, Rick, what are you doing? You don't belong in real estate. God made you to do this other thing, you know, use your yeah. voice, you know? Yeah. And he was the first person that came along that helped me see I was made for something else and to reconnect with what had been taken away or what I thought I had lost and I couldn't figure out how to get it back. So what did he do? He put me on a monthly retainer to do voice work for him. This is the guy with a huge, magnificent voice. He didn't need Rick Tarrant doing nothing for him. But it was an act of kindness. It was an act of love. Uh -huh. And it, <clears throat> I think it began to put that hope back in me. Okay, there's still a place for me in this world. Uh -huh. you know? and, uh, what, do you, what do you say to people because you, because you were allowed at such a young age to express your voice, mm. right? And I think a lot of people go through their entire lives <clears throat> not either not feeling like they have a voice or not feeling like they have a purpose or a mission. And I mm. mean, because of, because of our connection through Pedro, I mean, we joined through this mission, um, mission movement, right? Movement Makers mm -hmm. Mission. Um, that all of us have a movement within us. All of us have a message to share. And it is often tied to our pain and our struggle and how we, over, how we overcame that struggle, you know, how we, how we found the light, how we left our darkness and found our own sense of light so that we can share that light and that hope and that love with other people. Well, for me, I'm on the beginning part of that phase. And it started by meeting Pedro, the person that we're talking about there, mm -hmm. you know, mentoring, um, marketing mentor. Um, but he, he is a man of faith, and he's the first person um, who I was drawn to. I've always been repelled by the marketing guys out there on the internet world. They just Slick. seem... They're so slick. slick, so fake, so full of BS. Right. Um, and I, you know, I've been, I've been in advertising my entire life. So I, I, I smell it. Right. Yeah. Um, and I don't mind being advertised to, but I sure don't like being robbed. Mm. And um, after a few times of spending, you know, more thousands of dollars than I should have when you're broke as a joke um, on guys that, um, I don't know, all that to say, I didn't trust any of them. Mm -hmm. 
they might have been trustworthy, but I didn't trust any of them. And Pedro mm -hmm. was the first guy that came along and introduced that element of faith mm -hmm. into business, marketing and faith without being religious. You know, that's one thing I really loved about him is that, you know, he can be talking about Jesus one second and bullshit the next. <laughs> and for me, I like that. It's not that I like that. And it's just that, that. And a little hip hop. Yeah. Oh, he goes gangsta, gangsta P. Um, <laughs> but I appreciate that because that's, that's real. Yeah. This whole, I'm this, or, you know, you become a Christian and you have to act a certain way or quit smoking or quit drinking or quit cussing or quit any right. of that. Right. That is such a load of crap. Right. And it's not it, it's, there's a balance between, you know, being as uh, coarse and base as you can be. Uh, anyway, it, it's real easy. It's a fine line between um, walking uprightly and becoming a religious prick. Yeah. And I can't tell you where that line is. I just know it's about that thin and you can cross it very easily, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just, anyway, Pedro introduced faith and business. And, um, I told him, I said, you gave me hope. Mm. You're the, you really have given me hope that it's not over that, you know, that I'm relegated to just drawing a, you know, a piddly little social security check the rest of my days, mm -hmm. because I didn't choose that retirement path. You know, I chose voiceover and radio and it's like, you know, all my money was plowed back into the business. And then when the business went away, uh Oh, you know, you know, the, the last of my money went to my legal defense fund and uh, lost all that. So it's like I didn't I didn't make the plan where you could then just clip coupons the rest of your days, you know. Well, and you have um, you have your voice as long as you have your voice. You can get work and you can I mean, you've talked about teaching people. Why don't you want to talk about what what you're seeing for yourself right now? Well, that's interesting because today I'm really in a transition. Um, I, you know, I got after um, some coaching from Pedro, I launched my first what we call challenge, marketing challenge. I called mm -hmm. it the Find Your Voice Challenge, mm -hmm. which is interesting. I heard somebody named uh, Ivan in Ukraine or whatever also doing a Find Your Voice Challenge. And I'm like, uh -huh. well, there's nothing original, you know. Um, and I had about a dozen people on and I took them through uh, some of the same training that I've done in voiceover uh, coaching, you know, reading uh -huh. radio scripts, TV scripts, uh -huh. coaching them, you know, a little bit of acting background and then introduce them to some of the tools of the trade, whether that's microphones or, you know, how to use computers, some of the things that are involved in doing podcasts. I'm a little all over the place still. It's all tied into audio. I'm still sort of trying to figure it out. <clears throat> But then uh, yesterday, I talked to a friend who is uh, really a great marketer. He's not in the um, not in the same space. He's in the healthcare space, the nutrition space. He's not one of those guys that's out there selling multi thousand dollar coaching packages or anything. He helps people get through cancer, basically. Mm, wow! Um, but he's known me. We've known each other for well, going back to the '90s when he was just still in college, I guess. And now he's kind of a rock star out there in the uh, internet world. And he was like, Rick, why don't you reconnect with what you used to do? I mean, the Christian music thing. And he's like, yeah, why not? I was like, well, I kind of, I kind of did that. I'm sort of done with that. I don't even like to listen to it. It's all, it's coming out of that Nashville hit factory, you know, where all the songs mm -hmm. sound the same. Mm -hmm. And um, I really am not interested in that. But then he started rattling off some artist names that I know and people, well, actually people I used to go to church with, you know, uh -huh. who went off and became multi-platinum recording artists. It's like, what? <laughs> um, and he was saying, man, call up, call up John Cooper and do an interview with him. They started a band in the basement of our church called Skillet, which has just become huge out there in the world. And uh, call him and interview him. And he was just giving me these a strategy. So line up, you know, three or four of these artists that you know and record conversation like we're doing now yeah. and turning them into podcast and then he was like um and then invite me on we can talk about how we used to be on the worship team together and play music together and i can tell my story of surviving cancer and he said then i can tell my 
huge audience that he has now about your podcast. And um, I'm like, what? <laughs> and, and then I was talking to a, a, another friend this morning, and he's like, Rick, take yourself out of the equation. So I'm telling you about this guy. He wants to do a podcast, and there's this other guy that's going to promote it to probably 200,000 people. Uh, what's to think about? <laughs> and I'm like, I guess nothing. And he said, if you don't do this thing, Rick, you are a fool. I'm like, uh, man, he's never talked to me that directly. And I, so you just caught me at a point where I'm like, oh, am I about to launch a podcast and try to reconnect with a world that I used to, I used to be the category king, if you will, yeah. of, of that, that space. Right. You know, I was the go-to guy you called if you wanted something produced for an album or a concert tour or something like that in that space. Mm -hmm. And that's like, but that's, that's the past. That's, but here's what I'm thinking. Like what we're talking about right now, mm -hmm. if I could talk to people that I used to know in the, in the Christian music world about these sorts of things, mm -hmm. not about your record deal, not about the audiences you're playing for, right. not about this, but how did you get through tough times? How, yeah. did, how did you drive the birds away? Yeah. Maybe that's where I fit in. Maybe that's where, because of what I've been through, maybe now I can facilitate like you are today. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. In hearing their story, because all we see is their success. All we see is their lucky charms and their kitty cats. And <laughs> you don't see the 52 episodes that I did this year. And, you know, it's like I'm just having conversations. Yeah. But I'm saying this about the artist. All we see yeah. is their success. All we right. see is how wonderful, you know, they're on the album cover or the website or whatever. Right. It's all polished and right. looks wonderful. But if I could have real conversations, you know, then maybe, maybe therein lies where I belong. Because well, I like doing interviews. Uh -huh. um, so anyway, you just well, you caught I, me trying to figure it out. So No, and I, I mean, this, this was the reason why I wanted to start this podcast is to talk about people's struggles um, and not when they're stuck in them, but when they have overcome them. So, you know, so this is why I ask you, how do you get from this place of darkness and hopelessness to this place of I see some light and there still is hope. And I still, even though I'm not really believing in myself, I still... I still hang on to some sense of who do I want to become on the other side of this? Well, here's, um, I don't know how to tell you how to do this, but the, the sad thing is us guys. Anyway, our identity is so tied up in what we do. Yeah. It's what gives, at least it gave me value because right. remember I was that new kid that never felt like he had any right. value right. until I found something that then gate, then people validated me. Right. And, you know, of course, in retrospect, you know, the void is so deep, no, all the validation in the world is not going to Doesn't fill matter. It. Yeah. Everybody but, can tell you to your face, you're wonderful, you're wonderful, you're wonderful. But until you believe it yourself. Yeah. Which is, my, which, my very, which, go ahead. I was going to say my very first email address on AOL was Radio Rick. Because uh, somebody had called me that once. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. You know, so it, it's like, even still, you know. Um, which in the voiceover world is not a plus. They despise people from radio. The voiceover people, they talk bad about us. And I get it, you know, because a lot of times disc jockeys are kind of fake and, you know, hey, WHVQ, and here we are, you know. It's all, yeah, no. It's, be, it's be not real. a real, it's, be real it's, a, please. it's a persona, but it's not real. It was fun. God, it was fun, but it wasn't real. Yeah. You know, um, anyway, I, I, I ramble and digress. But if you could disassociate your identity from that thing you do, I think you'd be ahead of the game and realize, no, I have value. I sure have enjoyed doing that. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's time to use these tools Together. a different way, uh -huh. you know, in a different way. But I couldn't see. I just couldn't see. I wish I could. I wish I could say, oh, just do this and you'll be able to see. But I would say, try not to be negative. Try to stay upbeat. Try to look at new things as a positive instead of me, I did all the wrong things. So it's kind of like I tell my children, watch what I did and then do something else. Okay. <laughs> you know? So I tell my kids that about my marriage and subsequent divorce. Don't do what we did. Learn from what we did and 
do the opposite. Yeah, and do it better. And my do kids are doing that. They're making yeah. much better financial decisions. Um, but um, lost my train of thought. It just derailed off the off the track. No, it's it's doing. I it's mean, it's not just believing in yourself. Mm -hmm. It's well, like here here's a couple of mistakes I made. So I'm at Sirius Satellite Radio. I'm unhappy, and um, it seems like the only people they really valued there are marquee names. It's like they didn't care if you had 30 years or 40 years in, a, in the broadcast realm. They just really needed you to make it happen. They really want Oprah. They really want Howard Stern. They want, they really they want, want a brand they already. They want the big brands. I get yeah. it. It makes sense because <clears throat> nobody's going to subscribe to Sirius to hear me. But they'll, right. you know, they'll subscribe to hear Howard Stern by the thousands, right? So that, I get that. <clears throat> but it, it still didn't make you feel very, very valuable. But along, they, they bring in a guy that used to be on MTV, and he's the podcast king. And I'm like, what the hell is a podcast? It's kind of like when, when my friend came to me and said, I've got this idea for a blog. I'm like, a blog? I, well, these are the stupidest words. They're stupid <laughs> words. I hate it. It's like the grumpy old guy, right? It's yeah, the yeah. grumpy old men. The stupid words, stupid things. You know, I listen to a few podcasts, and I'm like, this is the worst thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Who would want to listen to bad radio <laughs> instead of, huh, I wonder if this could be something. You know, I've been doing this all my life. Yeah. I wonder if I could teach somebody how to do bad radio or maybe not so bad. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I met a fellow who somebody had uh, told me I should... Uh, check this guy out. He was the podcast answer man. <clears throat> and his story was he was an insurance salesman. Nothing wrong with insurance salesman. I don't mean to say that with derision, but he was the furthest thing from this, right? Right. And he and his wife do this podcast in their bedroom um, and suddenly find themselves with thousands of listeners. Wow. And he becomes, you know, this I'm sure six, seven, well, I'm sure he's a multi seven figure earner now. In fact, there's a, a podcast guru out there who's like a superstar right now who learned under this guy. Uh, and I remember having dinner with this fella and he was talking about these training courses he'd put up on the internet and wake up and find a hundred dollars in his PayPal account. And um, I asked him, I said, are you an expert with this piece of software? Because I am. He's not. Uh -huh. he said, no, I'm just happy to teach people what I know. Yeah. And I'm like, Dang, but I still, even though I saw him doing it, I saw him having success. There was that part of my brain that said, no, nah, this just is not right. Oh. You know, and yet I didn't jump in there. I can't tell you why, except I was scared or the Internet scared me or being uh -huh. seen scared me. Uh -huh. You know, the trolls, the haters scared me. I'm just being honest here. Um, Boy, so if you can not do that, you'll be, you'll be ahead of the game if you can see the possibilities, mm -hmm. which I think is tough when you get to be a certain age and you've had success with things being a certain way mm -hmm. and then the world shifts. Mm -hmm. It's tough to see that. And then you hear people like Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, here's how you do it. If you're not up, if you're not staring at your computer, answering emails until three o'clock in the morning until the blood's coming out of your eye sockets, you're not doing it right. I'm like, Holy crap, I, is that I, what it takes? Yeah, I'm not that person. <sighs> it's like, yeah. can we calm down just a little bit? You know? Yeah. No, I, but I, no. Think that, I think that's the thing, though, Rick, that, that you are who you are, which I think this goes into what you told me that your wife tells you a lot, is about, why don't you just say what your wife tells you? <laughs> oh, she says, I'll, I'll, I'll be downgrading myself, berating myself over something, and she'll say... Rick, you should be a better friend to yourself. Mm. She's the first person I ever heard say that. And it's like, you know, because those tapes okay. are from childhood. Right. Why don't you use your head for something besides a goddamn hat rack? That tape is still playing. Yeah. And it takes so much. That's why I'm back to the whole, and again, I apologize for the cussing and all, but Going back to the whole scripture thing, I talk about a juxtaposition. Better to meditate on those things. Yeah. Because it takes a lot of meditation to overcome those tapes in the neural pathway that were ingrained into a deep rut from the earliest. You know, right. 18 years with that negativity, and I mean no disrespect to mom and dad, but um, man, 
it it carves some you're, you're you're i'm no neurologist but i can just imagine it's like this rut that just gets ingrained and it's hard to hard to erase it you know so you have to constantly and and you know i built my business listening to people like zig ziglar and positive mm, thinking and jim yeah. Rohn. and i mean it brought me out it brought me into the light it yeah. brought me into a place where i could build a business and even dream about not being an employee but being an entrepreneur mm -hmm. it was zig ziglar was the guy yeah i mean you know wake up every day and clap your hands together and go it's going to be a wonderful day well gee whiz boys and girls but guess what <laughs> it worked but I where you know. focus i mean what you focus on right so why couldn't because, i remember because, that because where you are as a result of all the things that happened to you and all the things you told yourself back then yeah. and you think where do you want to be you know so so who yeah. where do you want to be and if if i want to be in that place over there who do i need to become what do i need to tell myself how do i need to treat myself what do i need to believe about myself yeah in yeah. order to be that person and that's what I was hearing from Zig Ziglar. He would say things like, the seeds of greatness are inside of you. You can go where you want to go. You can do what you want to do. You can be what you want to be if you help another, enough other people yeah. be what they want to be, you know? Yeah. And, I, you know, that's what, man, that revolutionized my life. And I remember my dad, he was such a skeptic and an atheist and just, you know, he's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But all I know is, when I discovered these uh, cassette albums to hear Zig, I used to, I couldn't consume it. And then when I found out there's other people like this, oh my goodness yeah. gracious. You know, it was, it was life changing. It was revolutionary for me because yeah. it, it caused a spark to begin to dream, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and somewhere along the way, I think I got too big for my britches and had some success and, you know, and I quit listening, mm -hmm. you know, quit devouring those things. and. Mm -hmm. I think I started thinking maybe I was better than I was, if that's, you know, because sometimes you just get some great breaks mm -hmm. and you get to ride the wave and you're not really that smart. You're just well, fortunate. Yeah. You know well, I, mean? I don't, I don't think it, I don't think it's a matter of being smart. I think well, it's you a know, matter my, of, I'm, I'm trying to put it in perspective, but I think sometimes we forget that maybe we got some help Yeah. and we get, too big for our britches, as mama used to say, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, so I definitely got knocked down in a notch or two, but I feel like I'm on the upward swing and I don't know what tomorrow brings, but I am, I'm like, okay, I'm, I think I'm on the verge of starting a podcast and, and which I hate that name too, podcasting, that's just a stupid name. It's a radio show. It is a radio show. <laughs> I'm going to change the name. It's not going to be a podcast. It's going to be, you know. It's not going to be a podcast. It's going right. to be a web radio show or something like that, because that is still, that's what turns my crank, you know? And yeah. if, if maybe part of my marketing is this old, you know, console from 1953, and I don't know, it's, it's a part of who I am, you know? Well, and didn't we talk about the voice of radio? I don't know. We I've been yammering on <laughs> No, before, but I, I, I think the point is that whatever lights you up mm -hmm. is where you need to be going because those things like you were talking about with the real estate, it was just like dragging you down and making you feel, whoa, you know, just I do not want to do this. Buck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like, instead of trying to chase a buck, how about chase my joy? Yeah. And just stay in a place that's really fun and exciting and I want to show up and it wouldn't even matter if I ever got paid a dime for it because I love it so much. Yeah. Well, that's kind of back to this equipment stuff. Yeah. And uh, this old gear, um, there's, a, there's a spark there and I don't even know why. Yeah. So it's like all I know is it's making me happy. Although yeah. yesterday, <laughs> I don't think I told you this. I plugged in this power supply that I drove all the way back for a drive back. I've cleaned it up. I've, I've repainted everything, given it, I mean, gotten all the bird poop off and made it look pretty. Yeah. So I finally uh, figured out how to get it wired up and put electricity to it. And the, the tube started glowing. And I'm like, oh, <gasps> wow, that is so exciting. So I leave my studio. I had to clean up something in the backyard because I'd 
turned my backyard into a workroom because I don't have a workroom. So I had a tent and my paint and all that stuff. And I'm cleaning that up and I come back in and I'm like, what the hell happened? <laughs> There's stuff all over the floor. There's actually, I've got stains on my curtain. My sound baffles had stuff all over it. What happened? Something had exploded. Oh, geez. From that power supply. Let me pull something out of the trash here. I'll show you. Um, this was the covering of a tube, a can, uh, actually a canister called a, a, a capacitor that's about two inches high uh -huh. and an inch and a half in diameter. And this was the foil and the cardboard and inside was insulation and some sort of oil product, a petroleum product, which left stains on my curtains. But I'm so grateful that I was not in here yeah. when it exploded. Oh, yeah, I no think kidding. I would have had a heart attack. <laughs> Yeah, because no evidently kidding. it makes a loud sound and capacitors <laughs> will do that. So from now on, as I'm testing out the new gear or the, this other gear, it's going outside. I'm running an extension cord. I'm going to let it run for hours. I did that with the, I plugged the power supply back in out in the yard, let it run all day today. So, cause my engineer said, yeah, if they're going to blow, it'll be within the first hour after being out of service. So I'm like, <laughs> we're doing this outside y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to ruin any more curtains and I'm so glad it was pointed towards the curtain and not towards my microphones and everything. It was like, yeah, what a mess. Yeah. So that was <laughs> anyway, but it, it wasn't discouraging to me. It was just kind of a shock. Um, and it's like, well, I knew that there were going to be some, it wasn't just going to be smooth sailing. Right, right. right. Gonna be some, so I just right. hit a stumbling block. Some learn, um, some learning opportunities. Well, and it kind of applies to our life and our yeah. starting a new business. So I yeah. think, Maybe when I was younger, maybe things were too easy. Uh. And maybe then when I hit that hard spot, I was devastated. Uh -huh. Maybe if it had been harder for me to get, maybe I would have said, well, I've done it once. I can do it again. Right. But that wasn't my story. Right. So even now that I've got gray hair, I feel like I'm still learning. So we always are learning. Uh, my, so. my grandmother used to say that. It's like, when I stop learning, I'll be in the grave. I hope so. Yeah. yeah that's, that's, that's the way I want to be. And I want to work until I just one day stop, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, as I'm finding the, my place in this world again, um, and I appreciate your encouragement and I appreciate you asking me to even talk about these things because yeah. um, it's not something you generally get a chance to, yeah. to share. And hopefully in a positive way. I know it was pretty down, but you know, that's. No, it wasn't I mean, down. I, I see the sun. I see the sun, you know. You see the light. Yes. Well, yeah, I see the sun. <laughs> Still don't like that light at the end of the tunnel thing. <laughs> um, you know, and then again, when the kids hug you and love on you and, mm -hmm. you know, my wife loves me and it's. Um, and I, t I talked to a, a fella today. We're going to do a, a, a thing uh, around the holidays. Uh, out here at the, the zoo around Christmas time. Anyway, we were talking about some of the technology things and he used to work for me 20 years ago and we haven't talked much in the last 20 years. But uh -huh. so we were catching up and, and visiting and uh, I told him a little part of, you know, he knew my backstory. He said, yeah, dude, you were, you were done wrong for sure. Yeah. Um, and I said, yeah, but, and I'm finding, you know, that there are some people that believe in me still when I thought nobody did. And he's like, dude, I'm, I'm one of those people, mm. you know, he was like, he, and he started telling me things that he learned from me mm. that I taught him that I had no idea I'd taught him anything. Yeah. You know, again, just do 180 from what I did and you'll be all right. But he was sharing things that, that he learned from me. And it was like, wow, old Rick needed to hear that, you know, yeah. that it, it wasn't all bad, you know, a lot of good happened and I was, a, I did help people. Yeah. So that to me is the thing. If you can figure out a way to help other people, then you won't mm -hmm. be sitting around thinking about your crap. Yeah. Because you'll be too busy seeing other people got worse crap. Yeah. You know, I yeah. mean, that may be overly simplistic, but. No, but I think, I think that is when you, when you get yourself out of your own sense of yuck <laughs> and you give to other people um, that you find meaning in your pain and heartache. You know, it's like, I'm not so bad. I'm, I'm okay. You yeah. know, I still have the capacity co to connect and to contribute and to provide a positive influence or impact on somebody else. You know, I think that's where um, I think a lot of 
churches and community organizations are missing the boat by not making opportunity available or letting people, you know, sometimes you'll say, well, we're looking for volunteers, but <clears throat> nobody's out there saying, we need you to help teach this child how to read. We mm -hmm. need you to help play guitar at the old folks' home. We have a place. It's already, you don't have to go out and invent it. We right. already have it set up. Right. And I think if, and maybe they're there and I just didn't know about it, but what a wonderful thing, you know, if, especially in the church community, if you were, instead of just somebody saying, uh, yeah, if you see a need, go meet it. No, here, we have a place to plug you in. Mm -hmm. I think that, and I didn't necessarily seek it out, but I wasn't seeing it either. Right. You know, so I don't know. Well, I, I, I'm not laying that off on anyone. I'm just saying to get involved, it would be helpful to have a way to get involved without you having to go reinvent the wheel. Yeah. Does yeah. that make sense at all? Yeah. 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 So I'm going to ask you because I want to be conscientious of your time. Um, but the, the last question that I usually ask people yeah. or usually the qu last question that I ask people, my guess, because this podcast is called wake up to real love. How do you define real love? <laughs> my, <laughs> my sweet Molly, you know, wow. That's overly simplistic, but man, when those kids say, I love you, Pops, that is real love. I was having a, I've got one grandson, seven years old. He's like, Pops, can we talk? Seven. That's so cute. Can we talk? Well, sure, Samson, what do you want to talk about? And we'll, we'll end up talking about some deep things. Uh, a couple of Saturdays ago, we even were talking about um, death and we were talking mm -hmm. about, you know, maybe, um, you know, he's, he, my oldest grandson passed away at 48 hours. Oh, so, so his name sorry. was Titus. And so his older brother is with Jesus, right? Aww. And so we're talking about, and maybe what about this idea, Samson? What if we're already with Titus mm. and time is not linear. I'm talking to a seven-year-old about this and he's tracking with me. He's tracking with me. He's like, yeah, like, so like we can't, he was like, so we were in heaven and now we're here and we'll be in heaven uh -huh. and with Titus. And I'm like, yeah. And what if in God's world, it's all simultaneous. It's all simultaneous. It's like we're there and we're, we are, you know, I kind of view it like a hard drive is not just linear information. They say it's scattered right. all over the hard drive, right? right? And the right. computer's smart enough to bring it all back together. So that's my theory of uh, time. And I'm having this discussion with my seven-year-old grandson. And he says, you know what, Pops? I sure am glad we're here in this time at the same time. Aww. I'm like... Oh, sweet. Seven Did you start years. bawling? I would have started crying. <laughs> I mean, he's always saying profound things. Aww. And um, yeah, so you said, what is love? To me, it's uh, these grandbabies, you know, because they don't have a ulterior motive for loving you. Uh -huh. You know, it's just. And they don't have all the junk and blocks. No. <gasps> And they're interesting characters and their personalities. And yeah. one guy's emotional and one's stoic and one's, you can tell he's going to be a hellraiser. And the other <laughs> one's like really quiet and studious. And it's like, wow. And we all came from the same DNA. <laughs> yeah. So it's pretty amazing to watch, you know. It's a beautiful Which then, thing. If you think about it, you give yourself a little more grace. Okay. Well, I came into this world wired a certain way, you know. Yeah. Quit trying to conform to what everybody else said you're supposed to be, you know. Uh-huh. That's why I think it's so important just to find and honor your own voice. Yeah, back to my find your voice challenge, which has not escaped me that it means more than learning how to talk on a microphone. Yeah. And if, if sometimes the voice has been taken away. Mm -hmm. Maybe not this voice, but yeah. this voice, you know. Right. So I haven't quite figured it out yet, but I'm, I'm beating the bushes, making a trail. Well, yeah, waiting for well, waiting for those sparks. We'll figure it out to, out to guide together. your way. Yeah. yeah. So don't believe the lies. Don't isolate yourself, and be a better friend to yourself. That's yeah. Beautiful words of wisdom, Rick Terrence. So if people want to find you and find your voice, how can they find you? 
I'm still isolating. I'm, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably just go to ricktarrant.com, T-A-R-R-A-N-T. Okay. And there's a, there's a connect tab up there and you can hear my voiceover demos and hey, if you want to hire me for a national ad, I'm available. So. <laughs> or even a local ad, you know, that's what I do. So <laughs> it's part of what I do. So Yeah. Well, I appreciate you being here. And I think that we've talked a little bit about, you know, looking to all these external things, you know, that that's not, you can't find yourself out there, right? So it always comes back to, which I say at the end of every podcast, the most important relationship you'll ever have is the one you have with yourself, which relates to be a better friend to yourself. Yeah. Right. I've recently discovered uh, meditation this year. I mm -hmm. mean, I've always scripture meditated, but just actually sitting and listening to the Calm app and being quiet for 10 minutes and just trying to just recognize that. And what, what's helped me is that, oh, like... Um, Yesterday, cleaning up this mess, I felt myself getting anxious. I felt myself getting uptight. Mm -hmm. I felt myself getting, it's like, okay, this is a thought. You can mm -hmm. let that thought go. Mm -hmm. This is an emotion. You know that emotion. You can let him fly away. Mm -hmm. Like they say, you know, you can't stop the birds from flying overhead, but you can keep them from making a nest. <laughs> I'm learning that, you yeah. know, which is, I wished I'd learned that when I was, boy, they should teach meditation in high school. Exactly. Yep. Which the first school. question I asked you, what they, what should you be taught? Yeah. These yeah, life, that, these that life skills. How to not let those thoughts control you, but to recognize, uh -huh. oh, now I know that's probably advanced, but still it, I think you could learn early. You know, it's kind of like uh, Jim like, Rohn used to say, how many languages can a child learn? As many as, as you're many as you to speak teach them. To, as many as you speak to them. Yeah, as many, you don't even, you don't even have to teach them. You just talk to them. Sure. Yeah. So right. they could learn meditation too, you know? Yeah. And just like, just like, just like, yeah. And like having those conversations with your seven year old. God, he's amazing. They're it's all beautiful. amazing. But, it's beautiful. Yeah. What a, what a gift um, you are to them and what a gift you've been to me and this podcast. I really appreciate you being here today. Oh, well, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to do it. And, you know, always happy to talk about myself. <laughs> oh, enough about me. What do you think about me? Uh, so thank, <laughs> thank you so much for being here. So listeners, um, if you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your friends. You know, there, you had so much wisdom to share, um, which is why I love having these conversations because I learned so much. And so, you know, people who know that they can help a friend share the message, you know, this is, this is what I'm here to do to help people you know, who have come through struggles and, and still hang on to hope and so that we can all have hope and we can all be better friends to ourselves and we can all love and accept ourselves right here and right now in our messiness. And when, we, when, we, when we're not in, seeing the sun, when we're seeing the darkness and how we're navigating between, you know, the same sides of the two, you know. The darkness will pass. Yeah. It might yeah. be there a long time, mm -hmm. but it will pass. Yeah. So I would just say cling to that hope. Yeah. And look for constructive ways to take care of yourself. You know what really brought me out was, uh, or started bringing me out was long walks. Mm. I mean, like yeah. 90 minute, two hour walks yeah. every day in the hot Memphis summer sun in the middle of the day. I mean, it just started to free up some cobwebs, you know? Yeah just like connecting with nature and just being. Yeah. And just, I think exercise is good for the brain, you know, yeah. so take, taking care of yourself, eating right. Don't drink yourself into oblivion. I tried that. That didn't work too good. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for being here, Rick. Um, and listeners every day, wake up to more and more real love. Uh, take care and we'll see you next time. Bye.